بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على سيدنا محمد الصادق الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استن بسنته إلى يوم الدين رب الشح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين Alhamdulillah wa shukrulillah. This is our second lesson in our tafsir of Surah Al-Fatiha. And in our last class, we gave a wide-ranging introduction into the foundations of tafsir, the science of Quranic exegesis or interpretation. And we talked about where it is situated among the Islamic sciences. We mentioned that the Islamic sciences are divided into the ancillary disciplines or the ones that are tools for learning and the sciences that are sought in and of themselves. So where does the science of tafsir fit in the Islamic sciences? Do we seek it as a means to something else that we want to know about or do we learn the science of tafsir for its own sake for its own sake the science of tafsir is sought for its own sake and because it is sought for its own sake we also have to learn the tools that enable us to understand it and that is Arabic and all of its sciences um, and other matters such as logic and the principles of tafsir. So we talked about that. We also talked about the ten foundations of the science of tafsir as we always do when we introduce a new topic. We go through the al-mabadi al-ashara, the ten foundations. And we talked about the basic methods of tafsir found in the books of tafsir. And inshallah today we're going to begin in earnest, bi'ithnillah, and we're going to look at the names of this chapter, Surah Al-Fatiha, and some other background knowledge on the revelation of this chapter. We'll also look at some of the unique qualities and virtues of Surah Al-Fatiha, and then we'll start with our discussion on At-Ta'awudh, or the dua we say when we begin reciting Surah Al-Fatiha, which is not from the Surah, it's not from the Qur'an uh, as such, but we say it when we read Al-Fatiha, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ So, when you look at cultures and civilizations, you will see that in the pre-modern period, as these languages had developed, in any culture or civilization, the people would give many names to things or objects of great importance to their survival and their life. For example, in Finland, where I lived for some time, there's dozens and dozens of names for snow. And that makes sense for someone who lives so intimately with snow, uh, if not eight months out of the year, a little less or sometimes even more. They had many names for snow. And when you look in ancient Arabia, you see they had many, many names for a camel, many names for horse, many names for a sword, many names for a tent, many names for dogs. In fact, in Arabic, there are 70 names for dog. Each name is describing some aspect of a dog. 
there's a story mentioned by Imam al-Suyuti. He mentioned that in Cairo, there was a blind man, a scholar of the Arabic language, who was walking down the street one day, and because he's blind and he doesn't see, he bumped into someone by accident. This person became upset with the blind man and said, watch where you're going, you dog. And the sheikh said, the real dog is the one who doesn't know 70 words for dog. And this is the story. Imam al-Suyuti said because of that, he wanted to make sure that he did not fit under that description. So he wrote an essay enumerating all of the different names for dog in Arabic and what they mean. So this exists in not just the pre-Islamic uh, Arabian culture, it's in every civilization. And if you look in the modern civilization or look at the West, what are some of the things that have a lot of names given to it? Money. <laughs> money. <laughs> exactly. So you have money, dollars, and we could go on and on. The ducats, the uh, cash, cream, uh, dough, uh, bread. These are all words that exist in English that are used to express different aspects of money or we give it a lot of names. Now, this what's, what's relevant about this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the Day of Judgment with many, many names. Just as the Arabs would describe things of importance with many, many names, Allah describes the Day of Judgment giving it many, many names to bring our attention to its importance. And Imam al-Ghazali, he talks about this in his final book of the Ihya, book 40, Kitab Dhikr al-Mawt wa ma on the mention of death. He says that there's a secret there, a sir, that each name has a certain aspect to it that is different from the others. And just as you see that in the Quran with reference to the Day of Judgment, the name of this chapter that we're studying also has several names. And it shows you the importance of the chapter and also some of the aspects of what makes it so special as a chapter. So, going through this, we want to start just with the Qur'an itself. The Qur'an has also been given many, many names. Imam al-Razi mentions 32 names that the Qur'an uh, gives to the book itself. And we don't mention all 32 in this class, but the famous ones. Kitab, right, book, Hujjah the strong proof as Allah says فَأْتُوا بِكِتَابِكُمْ إِن كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ uh, bring your, your, your book if you are truthful it's also a hujjah, a burhan it's also called the Qur'an the gathering unifying scripture which we mentioned in the previous class it's also called the Furqan now, does anyone remember why the Qur'an is also called the Furqan, the criteria? It separates between what is right and wrong. It confirms the truth present in the previous scriptures that have been interpolated and altered while refuting the falsehoods that were later added. So it is a criteria between truth and falsehood. Right. It's also called dhikr. فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Ask the people of the remembrance if you do not know. It's also called dhikra, which means a reminder. And there's many other names. Shifa, the healing. Bayan, clarification. It's also called hadith. The Quran is called hadith. فَبِأَيِّ حَدِيثٍ بَعْدَهُ يُؤْمِنُونَ What hadith will they believe in after this? And the Prophet ﷺ would say, 
in the khair al hadithi kalamullah the best hadith the best discourse is the speech of allah it's given many many other names and like the quran as a whole surah al fatiha has many many names and we want to explore these names and what they mean as this is a part of our understanding of tafsir of surah al fatiha so think of it as the tafsir of the name of the chapter itself before we even go into the chapter. The name of this chapter is Surah Al-Fatiha. What does Fatiha mean? It means the, the opener. But Surah Al-Fatiha was not the first chapter or the first verses revealed to the Prophet Wasallam. So in what sense is it an opener? Let's look at that. So when we explore the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu we learn that the first verses revealed to his blessed heart were verses 1 through 5 of Surah Alaq. And we talked about that in the seerah class, why that is significant and what lessons are contained in those particular verses and the wisdom behind them being the first revealed in that moment in the cave of Hira. Verses 1 through 5 of Surah Alaq were revealed there. Verses 6 through 19 of Surah Alaq were revealed later in the Meccan period when they tried to prevent the Prophet ﷺ from offering salat at the Kaaba. Those verses were revealed. Have you not seen the one who tries to prevent uh, a servant when he is praying? That's in reference to Abu Jahl, most likely, who was among those who tried to prevent the Prophet ﷺ from praying. So the first verses are 1 through 5 of Surah Alaq. After that came a pause, what they call Fatratul Wahi, when there was no revelation given to the Prophet ﷺ. And after some time, he received the verses of Surah Al Muddathir. And after that, he received verses from Surah Al-Muzzammil. Muddathir, the one who's wrapped up, and Muzzammil, the one who is wrapped up in garments. They're almost synonyms. But you see with Surah Alaq, it was verses 1 through 5 in the beginning, not the entire Surah. Then Muddathir, not the entire Surah. Muzzammil, not the entire Surah. The entire Surah was, the other verses were revealed later. The first chapter that was revealed in its entirety at once is Surah Al-Fatiha. It is the first chapter revealed in its entirety. But that still doesn't answer the question, why we call it the opener? Why would we call it the opener? The ulama say that Al-Fatiha, the opener, is called the opener even though it's not the first thing revealed. It's called the opener because it is the, the wasita or the means for the opening of the rest of the chapters. It is a means for the opening of the rest of the chapters. After the entire Surah Al-Fatiha was revealed, we find other chapters are being revealed partially and in their entirety. A lot of people have this idea that when Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam would re receive a chapter of the Quran, he's receiving it all at once. Surah Baqarah, all at once, uh, or this chapter or that chapter. That wasn't the case for many, many chapters of the Quran. They were revealed uh, in a partial fashion, and Allah mentions this in the Quran. Some chapters were revealed in their entirety. One such chapter is Surah Yusuf. That was revealed in its entirety. But this is after Surah Al-Fatiha, which was revealed in its entirety. It's the opener, and they say it is because the Fatiha is the opener of the Qur'an, and the arrangement of the Qur'an is tawqifi. It is by divine decree, by divine fiat. So even though it's not the first chapter revealed, or the first of the Qur'an revealed, it's the first entire chapter revealed, 
and it is the opener for the order of the chapters in the Mus'haf. So in that sense, it is the opener. So even though it's not the first thing revealed, it's the first thing put in the Mus'haf. That makes it an opener. It's also an opener because it is opening up the meanings contained in the other chapters. Remember, Surah Al-Fatiha encapsulates the meanings, implicit meanings within the rest of the Quran. So if it opens up for you the meanings of the rest of the chapters, it is the expression of what is contained in the other chapters of the Quran. And in this sense, it is the Fatiha. They also call it Fatihatul Kitab, or the opener of the book, which is very clear. You open up the Mus'haf, and this is the first chapter. It is also called Ummul Quran, or Ummul Kitab. What does Umm mean? Mother. When the Arabs use the word mother, they don't always mean uh, a literal mother. The word Umm is a very important word in Arabic, and from it many other words are derived, such as Imam. The Imam comes from Amma, your Ummu. It comes from that root. And we can say that Umm in this context means the source. What is the source of the child? It is the mother. The mother bears the child. So the Umm would be the essence of something. The, the, the center, if you will. Mecca is called Ummul Qura, the mother of the towns. So it is the essence of the book. It is the source. It is the font. It is the, to use fancy language, the quintessential expression of all of the Quranic meanings. And this is why it's called Ummul Kitab, the mother of the book. They also call it the treasure, the kens, with all of the jewels. The kens is that treasure that when you open it, you have all of the jewels. It's all contained there. Everything within the Quran is contained implicitly in Surah Al-Fatiha. It is also called Al-Wafiya and Al-Kafiya. Did I miss? Yeah, treasure. The wafiya and kafiya number four is the wafiya means it fulfills uh, and it suffices. Kafiya it suffices, meaning it is sufficient in terms of guidance. So kafiya comes from kafi. You say kafi, and hada yakfi. That's enough. It's sufficient. So it is sufficient in terms of guidance. And we say wafiya, it is the fulfillment, perhaps we can say. And the reason why we call it the fulfillment chapter is because it cannot be divided up like you can other chapters in salat. You know, if, you, if you're praying and after al-Fatiha you want to recite the first half of Surah Al-Ghashiya in the first rak'ah, you are free to do that and recite the second half of Surah Al-Ghashiya in the second rak'ah. You can read portions of this chapter and that chapter in each rak'ah, that's fine. And of course, there's always nuance to that, but it's fine. But can you recite the first half of Surah Al-Fatiha in rak'ah number one and the second half in number two? You can't. You have to recite the full chapter in each rak'ah, unlike other chapters. And this is why they call it al-wafiyah, meaning it is the fulfillment. You, you have to fulfill the recitation of this chapter in its entirety in each rak'ah, unlike other chapters. They also call al-asas. Asas means foundation. The asas is the foundation. 
It is the Aslul Qur'an. It's the foundation of the Qur'an. It sets the tone for the entire Qur'an as the foundation. It's also called, as you see, Suratul Hamd, the chapter on praise. Why? Why would we call it Suratul Hamd? The praising Allah. We open up with Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. It's also called Suratul Shukr, the chapter on gratitude, for the same reason. It's also called Suratul Dua, the chapter of supplication. And one that I didn't put on the board that I'll add is some scholars name this chapter Suratu Ta'aleem Al Mas'ala, the chapter that teaches you how to make dua. The chapter that teaches you how to make dua. Because Suratul Fatiha is a dua. And you see that it opens with praising Allah and glorifying Allah. And after that comes the request. So it's teaching you that when you make dua, personal dua, you praise Allah, you send salutations and prayers upon the Prophet wasallam, and then you put forward your request, your dua. It's teaching you how you express yourself when you make supplication. Uh, according to that, Suratu Ta'aleem al Masala, teaching how to make dua. So we have that, we have Suratu uh, Su'al, the chapter on the chapter of request or imploring. So the same thing, dua, dua, su'al, questioning or asking, supplicating, imploring, they're all similar. They also call it suratu al-munajat. Munajat mean intimate discourse, intimate discourses. So when you do munaja, it's basically uh, begging your Lord and praising Him and putting your, your question in a very intimate way. So it's teaching you how to do that. And it's also called Suratul Tafweed, the chapter on resignation, teaching you how to resign your affairs and leave them with Allah. It's also called a ruqya because ruqya is a means of healing. I don't know of one English word that really captures the essence of ruqya. Some people say incantation in English. I don't like that word because it evokes images of goblins and ghosts and witches and that's not the proper connotation here. But ruqya is when you use the Quran and you recite it on yourself or on someone else for healing. And we're going to look into that more because there's very clear hadith about using Al-Fatiha for that purpose. And because of that, it's called the Ruqya, a means of healing. Yes, teaching you and exp how to leave things to Allah and expressing that in words. And we have the name Ash-Shifa, the healing, similar to Ruqya, and Ash-Shafiya, the healing chapter. It is also called, and I'm not, we have 14 here, uh, Suratu As-Salat, the chapter on Salat, because it's essential to your Salat. Without the Fatiha, you don't have a Salat, because of the Hadith Qudsi, قَسَّمْتُ الصَّلَاةَ بَيْنِي وَبَيْنَ عَبْدِي نُصْفَيْنِ I have divided the salat between me and my servant in two halves. So the Al-Fatiha is called Suratu al-Salat.
Now in terms of reciting it behind the imam or not reciting it, that's a fiqh issue. And we're going to talk about that when we get to the basmala and other miscellaneous legal issues pertaining to al-fatiha. But let's just say, if you're by yourself, not praying behind anyone, you have to read al-fatiha. If you're behind the imam, there is a difference of opinion about whether the recitation of the imam counts as your recitation or whether you have to recite it even behind an imam. There's conflicting evidence and different positions and we'll, we'll look at that uh, for clarity inshallah. It's also called Surah An-Nur, the chapter of light. We have another Surah An-Nur, but we call this chapter Nur as well due to the effects it has on the heart. And lastly, this is 15, As-Sab'a Al-Mathani. The Sab'a Mathani can mean the seven oft-repeated verses. The seven verses that are repeated often. And that is because Surah Al-Fatiha consists of seven verses by ijma'a, by agreement of the ulama. They do differ about whether Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim is an ayah of Al-Fatiha or not, but everyone's in agreement that it consists of seven verses. That is why it will be called As-Sab'a al-Mathani. And this is mentioned in the Quran. وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَاكَ سَبْعًا مِنَ الْمَثَانِ It can also be called Sab'a Mathani because it's seven uh, phrases that praise Allah from thana or lauding and praising and extolling. These are the, the majority of the names given to Surah Al-Fatiha mentioned by the ulama of tafsir. What we see in all of these names is a description of what the chapter is all about. It's essential to salat. It is a means of spiritual and physical healing. It is a, a remedy and a cure. It is a way of teaching us how to praise Allah and thank Allah and worship Allah. It, it has all of these meanings in it. It, it expresses the essence of the Qur'an. And that's why we see all of these different names given to it. So this covers just the names. When you go into the books of tafsir, you'll find they'll say Surah Al-Fatiha, a, a Meccan chapter revealed in its entirety. And you have one Sahabi, I believe it was Jabir ibn Abdullah, who said that Surah Al-Fatiha is the first chapter of the Qur'an ever revealed. And they say, no, this is actually wrong. What he means is the first chapter that became uh, a condition for prayer or revealed in its entirety. It's the first chapter revealed in its entirety, not the first chapter revealed or the first verses of the Quran revealed. After that, they give you the names of this chapter. And then they look into the virtues of the chapter. And depending on the book of Tafsir, they may go into discussion on the ta'awudh. Why? Saying, A'udhu Billahi bin shaytan rajim Because we say that before reading the Qur'an. And because the first thing of the Qur'an we typically read is Surah Al-Fatiha, it makes sense to explain what the ta'awudh is, how we say it, what it means, its rulings, and the other situations where we're encouraged to read it. So, having looked at the names of this chapter, we want to look at some of the virtues of this chapter. And this is not on the board. What are some of the virtues of this chapter? What are some of the unique qualities of this chapter? Among the unique qualities of this chapter is that it is a pillar of the prayer. It is a condition of the prayer. The Prophet wasallam said, لا صلاة لمن لم يقرأ بفاتحة الكتاب There is no prayer for the person who does not recite the opening of the book. Scholars, of course, discuss whether that applies at all times or only when you're praying by yourself. And we'll explore that in our next class, why they differed 
and just to get a sense of where they're coming from. But it's a pillar of the prayer. Another reason, another virtue and unique quality of Al-Fatiha is that there are no other chapters like it in the previous revelations. In the Torah, the Injil, the Zabur, in the tablets of Sayyidina Ibrahim and Musa, the Suhuf, there is nothing like Al-Fatiha in these previous scriptures. And this is mentioned in a hadith from Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu. It mentions in this hadith that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to Ubay ibn Ka'b, would you like me to teach you a chapter that was not revealed in the Torah or the Injil or the Zabur uh, or even in the Quran that is like it? And he said, yes. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, what do you, or how do you recite in prayer? And Ubay ibn Ka'b said, we recite the Umm al-Quran, the Fatiha. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to him, وَالَّذِي نَفْسِ بِيَدِهِ مَا أُنزِلَتْ فِي التَّورَاتِ وَلَا فِي الْإِنْجِيلِ وَلَا فِي الزَّبُورِ وَلَا فِي الْفُرْقَانِ مِثْلُهَا By the one in whose hand is my soul, there is nothing revealed in the Torah, the Injil, or the Zabur, or in the rest of the Qur'an like it. It is unique in that regard. It is also a means of physical and spiritual healing. It's a means of ruqya, and it was directly sanctioned by the Prophet uh, in the hadith mentioning the companions who were on a journey they were on a journey and they came upon a village. They were lacking supplies. And they came upon a village of non-Muslims and they asked to be hosted as travelers. And the people in the village turned them down and they refused to host them. And as they were leaving, some people from the village came out to those companions and said, our chief has fallen ill. I believe it was a scorpion sting. Do any of you know a ruqya? And this tells you that even among the idol worshippers, they had their own ways of doing ruqya that may have involved praying to this or that idol or jinn, who knows. So the companions go back to the village, they go and see the chief, and the sahabi recite Surah Al-Fatiha over the site of the sting with the intention of it being a ruqya, a means of healing. And the chief was healed and they saved his life by means of this ruqya and the people in the tribe gave the sahaba many sheep to take back with them. They returned to Medina and they informed the Prophet Sallallahu about what happened and he asked them uh, how would you know that it's a ruqya? Uh, it's not an actual question, it's a declaration. وَمَا أَدَرَاكَ أَنَّهَا رُقْيَا وَكَمَا قَالْ And then he said, give me some of those sheep. Because he was the means of them knowing it. He took some of the sheep for his family. So this proves that it's a ruqya that was directly sanctioned by the Prophet Wasallam. And if you do it, then there's different ways. You can read directly over the spot and then do the nafath, this light blowing on the spot. Uh, or you can recite in water and put it on the spot or drink, drink it or have someone drink it. These are all different ways of administering the ruqya. But the ruqya is directly sanctioned by the Prophet You had your hand. Go back to what you said about the, um, the They said, oh, you know, the Fatiha is exactly like the Lord's Prayer, <laughs> right? And when you look at the Lord's Prayer, like when, at the time when I read it, like if anybody knows it, like I, I brought it up again because I obviously forgot a lot of things. 
there's lots of similarities. It's not the first person I've heard who used that, like saying that the Fatiha is similar to what Christians call the Lord's Prayer. Yeah. Yeah, like our Father, it says here, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed, hallowed, be, thy hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Mm -hmm. I mean, alhamdulillah, like there's nothing, when you read that in English, there's nothing wrong with it. But like, well, we would take out Father, you, what but... What do you say to people who say that? Like, everything you are saying to me makes sense. Mm -hmm. But, you know, people who say, well, what about our Father? That's very similar to Fatima. And the person who told me this, like I said, is not the first Muslim I've heard who, right. when doing Dawah, right. they kind of say similar things to... They'll say that Fatiha is our version of the Lord's Prayer. prayer yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, we would have to take out our Father. Of course. That's yeah. the right. first part, right? Uh, the, the answer is from two angles. Uh, number one, when we hear phrases in Arabic like, like, or similar, we understand that it doesn't negate... Uh, well, the, the word here is mithil, right? Like it. It doesn't negate resemblance from some angles, right? But it doesn't mean that the two are ultimately the same, right? When the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith, Kun fi dunya ka annaka gharib aw abi sabil. Be in the world as though you are a traveler uh, or a stranger. This is only from certain angles, right? We wouldn't say that you can shorten your prayers for the rest of your life because you're a traveler in this world. No, you're, you're a resident while you're a traveler in this world. Um, so when you say like, it doesn't mean that it's neg negating any form of similarity, right? Because w let's leave aside the Lord's Prayer and its origin for now because we're looking at a translation of something. But let's just look at the Torah and the Injil and the Zabur. All of this is Kalam Allah. All of this is the speech of Allah. And the speech of Allah all together is the same in the sense that it's Kalam Allah. It's different in terms of its expressions because the expressions may be in the form of commands or prohibitions or narratives of past nations or rhetorical questions uh, or descriptions of unseen realities. There may be co-sharing in those things, but there's nothing in those scriptures like the Fatiha in its concision, its conciseness, and in the ability to extract uh, incredibly deep meanings that are expressed elsewhere. So that will be the answer. As we go through the tafsir, you'll see, as we go into it, we'll, we'll be extracting all of the aspects of the religion from it. You'll see how there literally is nothing in Islam except that it is found implicitly in Surah Al-Fatiha. And all of that is found within Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So, uh, hopefully that answers it. When you say like, it doesn't negate there could be aspects that are similar because we're talking about the kalam of Allah. And that's going to open us up to another issue that's actually I'm going to address right now in the third virtue when we talk about the superiority of Surah Al-Fatiha uh, or for that matter other verses uh, over other chapters or other verses and what that means theologically. So... So using that, we'll, we'll segue into that discussion. After mentioning the fact that there's nothing like Al-Fatiha in the other chapters of the Qur'an or in the previous scriptures, another unique quality of this chapter is that it is considered the most superior chapter with respect to us. And I repeat that. It is the most superior chapter with respect to us. Let's do two things here. 
with respect to us. Let us do two things here. Let us, number one, establish that. And then number two, explain what we mean. How do we know that Surah Al-Fatiha is the most superior chapter of the Qur'an with respect to us? It is because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has told us. There is a hadith from Abu Sa'id ibn Mu'alla radiallahu anhu who mentions that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said لَأُعَلِّمَنَّكَ سُورَةً هِيَ أَعَظَمُ السُّوَرِ فِي الْقُرْآنِ قَبْلَ أَن تَخْرُجَ مِنَ الْمَسْجِدِ he says, I shall certainly teach you a chapter of the Qur'an uh, is the greatest of the chapters of the Qur'an. A'azam, the supreme chapter of the Qur'an uh, before you leave the masjid. This is what he's telling Abu Sa'id al-Mu'alla. I'm going to teach you the tr- best chapter before you leave the masjid. And then he says that he took him by his hand and when he wanted to leave, he said to him, Ya Rasulullah, didn't you say you're going to teach me the most superior chapter of the Qur'an? The Prophet Sallallahu replied by reciting, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Hiya Sab'ul Mathani Wal Qur'anul Azim Alladhi Utituhu. He recited the first verse, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. This is the seven off-repeated verses, Surah Al-Fatiha. Uh, and the tremendous Qur'an that I was given. So here you have in this hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu telling Abu Sa'id al-Mu'alla that Surah Al-Fatiha is أَعَظَمُ السُّوَارِ فِي Quran, which means the most superior chapter in the Qur'an. That establishes it for us. But what does it mean exactly when we say that Surah Al-Fatiha is the most superior chapter in the Qur'an. And why do we say with respect to us? We have to pay very close attention to that caveat. It is the most superior chapter of the Qur'an with respect to us. Because the Qur'an is Kalamullah. Going back to our Aqidah class, what do we say about Kalamullah? It is one of the divine attributes. It's one of the beginningless, endless divine attributes. It is without beginning. It is without end. It is without likeness. If a person says, chapter X, surah X, is superior to surah Y, and both of these are kalam Allah, what you have is, Fadil and Mafdul. You have the superior one and the one that is less superior. If you say it like that without adding clarity, it gives the impression that one is superior and one is less superior. One is lacking in some way. One is deficient in some way with respect to the superior chapter. Does that make sense? If you say, just using these two pins, if we say the black pin is superior to the red pin, this means that the red pin is lacking in some ways with respect to the black pin. Even if you say the the red pin is good, it's excellent, it does its job, because you've said the black pin is superior, it implies that the red pin is inferior at least in comparison to the black pen. That makes sense? You see the problem here? If you say that there is tafadul in the Qur'an, there is relative degrees of superiority with some chapters better than others, without adding this clarification, it's a problem because the Qur'an is kalam Allah as a divine attribute. You cannot say that the attributes of Allah are lacking in any perfection. Right? So what does it mean? When the Prophet Sallallahu is saying that Surah Al-Fatiha is superior to other chapters, it is with respect to either the reward that we receive or the comprehensiveness of meaning that it contains 
not that one chapter is superior to another chapter. It is only superior with respect to us in various ways. Either Surah Al-Fatiha, if you recite it, you have more uh, reward or than another chapter, or its meanings are more comprehensive than the meanings of another chapter, right? If you go to Surah Al-Baqarah, for instance, uh, in Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah Ta'ala says, مَا نَنْسَخْ مِنْ آيَةٍ أَوْ نُنْسِهَا نَأْتِ بِخَيْرٍ مِنْهَا أَوْ مِثْلِهَا That we do not abrogate a verse or cause it to be forgotten except that we bring one better or one like it. So certain ayat have been abrogated. They're no longer uh, applied in terms of rulings. The, because abrogation pertains to rulings, not reports. So does that mean that what is abrogated is replaced with something better? It means that this verse is better than that verse? No, as we said, it's only with respect to us. Therefore, when Allah says that we do not abrogate a verse or cause it to be forgotten, except that we replace it with something better than it or like it, it means uh, better for you th in terms of ease or facilitation. The verse that was abrogated was a harder ruling and it was abrogated by a verse that makes things easy. So it's better in terms of its facilitation and ease for us. Not that one verse is better than another verse. It's all kalam Allah. It's all the words of Allah. Yes. 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 Exactly. So anything you find describing the virtues of this chapter or this verse, it is with respect to its benefit for us and the rewards that we get when reciting them. And it's not a comparison between this chapter and that chapter. Uh, on its own, where one would be superior to the other, because it's all kalam Allah, without beginning, without end. It's so. This is a theological issue that we want to clarify. Uh, it's fairly simple if you understand that when we say better, it means with respect to us, and it's not saying that this is better than that intrinsically, or, because there's implications there that are quite problematic. Now. That's what we have to say about the virtues and the unique qualities of this chapter. We said that Surah Al-Fatiha was the first chapter revealed in its entirety from beginning to end. Some of the ulama have said that it was revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu twice. They say it was revealed once in Mecca and another time in Medina when the Qibla was changed from Jerusalem to Mecca. That's the position of some ulama. Either way, it's the first chapter revealed in its entirety. Prior to Al-Fatiha, the other three chapters were only revealed in segments. Surah Alaq, Surah Muddathir, and those verses in Surah Muzammil. This is the first entire chapter recite, uh, revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And before we read the Fatiha and before we read the Quran what are we encouraged to do? We're encouraged to say A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah Al-Nahl that when you recite the Quran وَإِذَا قَرَأْتَ الْقُرْآنِ فَاسْتَعِذْ بِاللَّهِ Minash Shaitanir Rajeem When you recite the Quran seek refuge in Allah from shaitan, the accursed. So Allah commands this when reciting the Qur'an. And this command is directed to the Prophet Wasallam, but it's meant for the entire ummah because in this sense he is the wasita, he is the means of us receiving that. So let's look at the ta'awudh 
and get a deeper understanding of it. Yes. It's on the board. Oh, sorry. Right there. Yeah. So we want to look at the, the ruling of reading the ta'awudh, the hukum, the description, the meaning, and the places and circumstances where it's good to recite it. So what is the ruling of recite of reading the ta'awudh, saying, A'udhu billahi min shaytan rajim Is it wajib? Is it sunnah? Who knows? So, right, before reading Qur'an. Okay, so you said it's wajib because Allah says as a command. Allah also says, kulu washrabu. He says, eat and drink. But do you have to eat and drink all the time? Because sometimes the command form is not for a direct command of wujub, of obligation, but a recommendation or even permissibility. So just because it comes in a command form doesn't mean it's automatically wajib. That's the default. Yeah, when you have a command form, the default is yes, it's an obligation. But there are other evidences that would indicate that it's not. The majority position of the ulama is that it is sunnah and not wajib. It's an isolated opinion. I want to say from uh, Sa'ib bin Musayyib, rahimahullah, who I believe said it was wajib, based on it being a command. Um, but the majority say it is a sunnah. And they say it is a sunnah according to, uh, according to the majority. When reading the Qur'an, uh, in Salat or outside of Salat, they say it's Sunnah. For the Hanafis, for the Hanafis out there, it's seen as a Sunnah in the first Raka'ah only. And for the Shafi'is, there are two views. They, one says in the first Raka'ah only, the other view says in every Raka'ah, when you're reciting Al Fatiha, of course, you will recite the Ta'awudh. The Malikis is actually makruh to recite it in Salat. But you didn't know that. You recite it in Ramadan, in prayer, in Taraweeh, or you just recite it before reading Quran, but you're not reading the Ta'awudh in prayer, the obligatory prayer. It's actually seen as disliked. Uh, and they have their reasoning for that. So we'll, we'll leave all of that. They only recite it in Taraweeh or when reciting Quran outside of prayer. But the majority say it's sunnah, uh, in prayer and outside of prayer. Uh, why do we say, A'udhu billahi min shaytan rajim when we begin reading Qur'an or when we recite the Fatiha in prayer? The ulama talk about this, the wisdom behind the ta'awudh. And they say the wisdom is because reciting Qur'an is an act of worship. It's an act of ibadah. And for an act of worship to be accepted, what is required? Well, what's the condition of your actions being accepted by Allah? Sincerity of intention. Right, so it's an act of worship to recite the Qur'an. Any act of worship requires sincerity. Therefore, it is the way of shaitan to whisper to you when you engage in worship to distract you from presence of heart in that worship or to diminish the reward and hence the command to say a'udhu billahi min shaytanir rajim to be in Allah's protection and refuge in that act of worship and when you recite the ta'awudh you're seeking protection from Allah uh, Allah's protection from shaitan and this gives your heart some ease and opens your heart to receiving more from what you're reciting. So this is the basic wisdom. You're asking Allah's protection as you engage in a virtuous act of worship that shaitan tries to corrupt through either spoiling your sincerity or distracting you so that you are not focused on the meanings of what you recite. Or even if you don't know the meanings of what you recite, he tries to get you to lose focus so that you are 
less attentive to the fact that it is kalamullah, the speech of Allah Almighty. Even if you don't understand it, there's virtue in reciting. And even in those situations, if you're reciting Qur'an and you don't understand anything of what you're reciting, even then, shaitan will try to distract a person so they lose sight of the fact that this is kalamullah. So they're just reading it in their minds elsewhere. So that's the wisdom. As far as the description goes, the description here means how you say it. There are two ways you, you can say the ta'awudh. How do you say ta'awudh? I don't mean tajweed wise, I just mean the words. What do you say? Right, that's the most common way we read it. There is another way, and this is also reported in the hadith of the Prophet Wasallam. And it is also mentioned in the Quran, and that is, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ السَّمِيعِ الْعَلِيمِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ It's the same as the ordinary one, except that after mentioning the name of Allah, you also mention the name السَّمِيعِ, the all-hearing, and Al-Alim, the all-knowing. Therefore, it means, I seek refuge in Allah, the all-hearing, the all-knowing, from shaitan, the accursed. In Arabic? A'udhu billahi as-sami'i al-alimi. I'll say it all the way through. A'udhu billahi as-sami'i al-alimi min ash-shaytan al-rajim. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, some people do it. It's good to do it. Uh, if you stick to the ordinary one, that's fine. If you want to add in a little variety because it's something the Prophet ﷺ did, that's also good. These are the two ways we have received the dua of ta'awudh. And ta'awudh literally means seeking refuge. Let us look now at what it means, each word, one by one. And then we want to answer the question, why do we say As-Sami' and Al-Alim in particular, in that second way of reading it? So the first word we say is a verb. You're saying I, Ana, A'udhu, A'udhu. A'udhu is basically saying you seek protection, you seek refuge, you seek a mighty fortress of protection and security. This is tahassun wal iltija'i wal istijara, different words they use in Arabic to describe this. You seek Allah's protection and refuge and His uh, divine aid from the evil of shaitan and his corrupting influence in your deen and dunya. A'udhu billahi. I seek refuge in Allah, protection from Allah. I seek the secure fortress of divine aid and sanctuary. All of these meanings are there in A'udhu. In Allah. Mina shaitan al rajim from shaitan who is a rajim what is the meaning of shaitan we say satan in english shaitan in arabic the ulama mentioned two opinions about where this word comes from i didn't write them i will write them now just so you have it here So you have, sorry, for the second one, I want to give you the verb form. Um, so we have two words here. We have shatana and shata. Because in Arabic, uh, sometimes the noon in a word can be uh, 
extra. It can be added to it. If you say, if you look at the word tired, for instance, it comes from the root ta'in ba. Ta'iba. And someone so who is tired would be, anyone know? Ta'ban. Ta'ban. If you are angry, it comes from ghadab. Ghain, dad, ba. If you are angry, you are ghadban. The noon. The noon's extra. The alif and noon are extra. And they indicate internal qualities. Right? Not to make this an Arabic class, but words with an alif and noon at the end, nouns with an alif and noon at the end, are often uh, nouns describing internal qualities. Ta'ban means you're tired. Na'asan means you're sleepy. Ghadban means you're angry. Jaw'an means you're hungry. That's internal. Shab'an uh, means you're full. Atshan means you're thirsty. Those are all internal things. So shaitan is said to come either from shatana or shata. The first one, shatana, mean, means ba'uda, to be far, to be remote, to be distant. This would mean that shaitan is called shaitan because he is far, distant from Allah and from the mercy of Allah and far from all good qualities. He is far off from all of those things. Far from his Lord, far from Allah's mercy, far from good qualities, distant and remote. That's the majority position, is from shatana. Others suggest that it is from shata and that the noon, alif and noon is extra. And shata, yashitu in Arabic means to be false, to be batil, to be engaged in falsehood. So this would mean that he, shaitan literally means the, the false one, the one who is all about elevating falsehood and fighting against truth. That's the second view. And both of the meanings are correctly applied to shaitan. He is at once distant from Allah's mercy and calling to falsehood. But we see in the ta'awwud there's another quality given to him. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani ar-rajim. Ar-rajim. What does that mean? Uh, rajim here it means marjum or one who is outcast, one who is rejected, one who is cast out and cursed. So rajim, if you think of an animal coming into your tent, you, know, you probably shouldn't do this, but if an animal comes into your tent, you could throw rocks at it or just shoo it away. You cast it out. So rajim is from Rajim. Rajim, when we pelt the stones at the Jamarat, that's called Rami, right? Rami and Jamarat. So Rajim means one who's cast out and rejected. It can mean stoned in that he is cast out, turned out of Jannah, turned out from Allah's mercy. It can also be literal, literally stoned. I don't mean in the, in the conventional sense. I mean stoned as in meteors and heavenly bodies cast at him and his jinn ilk. They're cast out of Jannah. He's cast out of Jannah and he's assailed with meteors. That's mentioned in Surah Al-Jinn, right? At the end of the day, it means mal'un, cursed and matrood, ejected and kicked out, uh, removed outcast from Allah's mercy. And the ulama mention when they talk about ta'awudh that if shaitan did not have a negative influence on human beings, if he did not whisper and have an impact on us, Allah would not tell us to seek refuge in Allah from him. 
Allah does not tell us to seek refuge in Allah from harmless things. We don't seek refuge in Allah from anything that's harmless. We seek refuge in Allah from things that can affect us negatively. That is a proof that he could harm us or we fall under his influence. Therefore, we need Allah's protection from his whisperings. He cannot force us to do anything, but we can still succumb to the whispering. So we have, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ Why do we have the other narration mentioning the two names of Allah, السَّمِيعِ and الْعَلِيمِ The all-hearing and the all-knowing. Imam al-Razi, he talks about this, and he says that the effects of the waswasa of shaitan are like letters inscribed in your heart, suggestions, whisperings in your heart that no one else can hear. When the whisperings come, it's like speech that no one else can hear. It's as if when you say, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ السَّمِيعِ الْعَلِيمِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ It's like you're saying, O oh Allah, O oh you who can hear all things, who hears all concealed things, you hear the whispering of shaitan in my heart, and you know his intent, so protect me. This is the relevance of the name as samir to this formula. What about Al-Alim, the all-knowing? Imam al-Razi says that this actually corresponds to a verse in the seventh chapter, Surah Al-A'raf, where Allah says that if a suggestion from shaitan should uh, assail you or assault you, نَزْغٌ فَاسْتَعِذْ بِاللَّهِ Seek refuge in Allah. إِنَّهُ هُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ He is all-knowing. He knows the whisperings that people hear and encounter. So you ask Allah by His name, السَّمِيعُ and الْعَلِيمُ The all-hearing and the all-knowing. When you're seeking refuge from the whisperings of one whose whisperings are not heard by others and are not known by others, but are heard and known by Allah. Does that make sense? This is the relevance of those two names to the dua itself. So this covers the ruling on the ta'awud, the two different ways we say it, and the meanings of the ta'awud. What we're left with is really a, a number of narrations of hadith that describe to us the situations or places where it's recommended to say, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم. And that is because it's not limited to reciting Qur'an or when in salat. Those are not the only two situations where we say, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم. There are several others. And uh, for lack of time, we'll, we'll go through them one by one. Most of these are familiar to you. Maybe a few of them are not. But these are all from the hadith of the Prophet Wasallam. We know that it's recommended to say the ta'awud when one is angry. And there's a hadith to this effect. Uh, there's a few hadith, actually, that speak about this. And it's to be said in a time of anger, because shaitan uh, inflates the anger and tries to escalate it. And by saying, A'udhu Billahi bin shaitan al-Rajim, we are able to diminish it. It doesn't mean that the anger disappears like that, but we take the means of seeking Allah's protection, lest it escalate more, and so that we can do the right thing in the heat of the moment. And oftentimes we, we get angry and we only think of the ta'awudh after we've gotten angry and we wish we had said it. But it's to say it the moment you get angry to limit it and keep it from getting worse than it could be. Another time we seek refuge in Allah Ta'ala is when going to the bathroom. Now here we're not saying, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajim in that formula, 
it's a different formula, but it's still ta'awwudh. Note what I'm saying here. We're talking about the times where it's rec- recommended to do ta'awwudh. And ta'awwudh can be a'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajim or some other form of dua that is ta'awwudh, seeking refuge in Allah. So when going to the restroom, we know the famous dua that when you enter, you say bismillah, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al khubthi wal khaba'ith or khubuthi. So you're saying, oh, in the name of Allah, O oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from the evil male and female jinni shayateen, basically. And the purpose of that is to cast a shield of protection between, now people don't know this, that the purpose of that, you say bismillah and this dua before you walk inside of the lavatory, the restroom. Uh, we mean the toilet, right? If, if there's a large area and there's a shower and the bathroom's over there, that's not what we mean. But the toilet, we're not doing dhikr in the toilet. The purpose of saying that dua before going to that area is because when you say it, Allah casts a hijab between your awra and the shayateen. So the shayateen cannot actually see a person's awra when they say that, even after they've removed their clothing and uncovered their awra. So it's actually a spiritual awra for a person who has removed their physical clothing and exposed their physical awra. It is that kind of protection. Yeah, you could say it when going to that general area. The, the point I'm making is, you, if you do dhikr in the hammam, I'll, I'll tell you a story just to clarify this. The word Arab in Arabic, uh, hammam, is often translated as bathroom. When we think of a bathroom, we think of a toilet and a shower and a sink. If it's a half bath, half bathroom, we think of a toilet and a sink. But in Arabic, it's not the case. Because hammam, in its original Arabic meaning, denotes the bath. Right? The hammam, the Turkish baths, those larger ones, or the, in Morocco or elsewhere, those are called the hammam. It's not a toilet. Right? So there's a story mentioned in. I can't remember the source. Anyhow, is the bi- in the biography of Imam Tajuddin al-Subqi. Tajuddin al-Subqi was one of the great mujtahid Shafi'i Imams. And uh, it is related that he was so constant in his dhikr of Allah that he was even engaged in dhikr in the hammam. So someone who didn't like Imam al-Subqi found this narration and said, look how bad this person is. He's making dhikr in the toilet. And they think he's a big scholar, yet he's making dhikr in the toilet. And they were being ignorant. They failed to realize that the hammam is just the bath. That's not a place of najasa. That's not where a person relieves themselves. You can do dhikr there. You don't make dhikr in the toilet. Our challenge is that bathrooms have both showers and toilets. So one can reasonably argue that you can say the dua before entering that bathroom area and once you enter the shower and close the shower curtain on you, you are separate from the toilet area. You can do the basmala and whatever dhikr you need in the shower area that you would not make when you're immediately outside of it. What's the difference? In that time, in the time of the Prophet them most of the houses had, had curtains as doors. What is the difference between your house and someone else's house or the open public area? It was a curtain, right? They didn't even have toilets. They had outdoor areas, the khala. So dhikr in an enclosed space separated where you have the toilet separated from the shower area, separated by a shower curtain, I believe that is sufficient. There's no reason to say that it has to be a door in order for that to be a separate space, even though culturally we associate the entire place as a bathroom, right? Uh, so you could do the dhikr in the shower, 
close the shower curtain, you're separate from the toilet area. Wallahu alam. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, you could do that too. Um, you, you, if you're saying it before you enter the bathroom area, you have that protection. You enter the shower, you close it. If you say Bismillah, you're fine, right? So it's all good. You're still in that enclosed space under Allah's protection, inshallah. Right? Because there's two separate things going on here. Entering the bathroom, the toilet, I mean, and there's a specific dua that we say, the dua that we just covered. And when a person is in the shower, if they're taking the ghusl or they're making wudu in the shower, they should say bismillah. So that's another dhikr, separate from the dhikr you make when going into the toilet area, right? Some people say, well, if I'm going to a toilet area, I'll say Bismillah before I go inside. Right? That's fine. It, it, it's a confusing issue because we associate the entire space with, we call it all bathroom, and we don't want to make dhikr in the bathroom or the toilet where there's najasa, but at the same time, there's some separation there. So you'd say Bismillah when doing the wudu or the ghusl, and you wouldn't say Bismillah when you're in the actual toilet area. So there's kind of an artificial separation here, isn't there? Like I, I noticed, for instance, when I was living in Jordan, in all the houses, there's a sink area outside of the bathroom area. Yeah. So you make wudu there, and you would, yeah. So there's always like a sink area that was outside, separate from the toilet area, right? Yeah. yeah. So the conclusion would be, if you're going into the restroom area to use the restroom, you would say the dua before entering, that's your purpose. If you then go to the shower for wudu or ghusl or whatever, and being in a new enclosed space, you could say bismillah, it's not as if you're making dhikr on the toilet, it's not the same thing. So technically if you enter your bathroom just to make wudu, yeah. Yeah, you just you don't necessarily have to say Auzu billahi min ash before. I mean, like you don't have to make the dua because you're just entering if you're entering your bathroom with the intention of just making your dua at the sink, not going to the toilet or something. I'm just yeah. being a little bit I, Yeah, yeah, I mean, I hear people say if your intention is that, you could do the do the dhikr and say the dua, uh, do the dhikr and say bismillah yeah. uh, right when you walk in okay. as you would as most people do. Right. Uh, the issue is that our bathroom setups are not like the bathroom setups in the pre-modern period. They would have the toilet space separate from the bathing space. And they didn't have this issue. Because for them to go relieve oneself is either outside or at, in a specific place for that. And in, a, in either case, you're making the dua, Bismillah, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-khubti wal khaba'ith and their shower or their hammam or wherever they would bathe for ghusl or wherever they would make wudu will be separate from that space and when you're there you're making you're making dua you can say bismillah in any other form of dhikr and my question is you say that hijab and like you say hijab between this so the shayateen don't see you so when you change clothes it comes to my mind how about changing clothes and also yeah, and it's not to say that the jinn are seeing people 24-7 wherever they are and that when you close your door they're still hanging out. You know, there's ways of getting them out <laughs> through dhikr and dua. Uh, but that's just the wisdom behind saying it when going into the uh, restroom area, the toilet area. Right. We have du'as specifically for putting on our clothes. We have specific du'as. Yeah, and, and then removing as well. So Bismillah is saying is enough just Bismillah. Yeah. Don't have to say the whole Bismillah. No. So we have more. Um, we're not going to give as much detail to the rest of these. 
Um, in general, um, so we have when angry, going to the bathroom. We have also uh, for protection uh, in general. When a person, if they feel like they're dealing with waswasa, whisperings of shaitan, or ideas are coming into their head, they can say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajim. Uh, likewise, when you go into the masjid, this is actually a sunnah. This, in one of the hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu said that, or it's reported about him, that when he would enter, he would say, A'udhu Billahi Al-Azim wa bi wajhihi al-kareem wa bi sultanihi al-qadeem min ash-shaytan al-rajim I seek refuge in Allah the tremendous the magnificent and by his noble countenance and by his pre-eternal authority from shaytan the accursed and he said about this dua sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when a servant says this dua when entering the masjid uh, shaytan will be Protect, he will be protected from shaitan the rest of that day. Qala sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Hufidha minhu ay min ash-shaytani sa'iru al-yawm He will be protected from shaitan the rest of that day. So when you go into the masjid, you can learn this dua, you can say it. Likewise, when going on a journey, when you go on a trip, you, can, you say ta'awud, when you go on the trip, when you say the long dua of travel. Uh, many of us have memorized that dua, especially those of us who travel a lot. There's a dua you say when you leave your home on a journey. There's a dua you make when you're making your way back. In that dua, you say, Allahumma anta sahibu fi safar wa khalifa tu fil ahl. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min wa'atha is safar wa ka'abat al mandar wa su'il munqalab wa su'il al mandar. It's a long dua. You're seeking refuge in Allah Ta'ala. Also, when you are, what do we have here? Uh, nightmares. If you have a nightmare, the Prophet Sallallahu says, you should not convey that dream to other people. You keep it to yourself. And if you're awakened from that dream in the middle of the night, you turn to the left side, you do the nafath, and you seek refuge in Allah from shaitan. And you don't relay the dream because you don't relay nightmares. It's just, it's either from yourself or it's from shaitan. It's either your own nafs and internal things where your ideas are mixed up or your emotions are mixed up or it could even be a physical ailment or it's from shaitan. Either way, we don't tell nightmares to other people. We just seek refuge in Allah from shaitan. Uh, insects, and actually this is insects, poisonous creatures, and the creepy crawlies. We don't deal with them as much these days as people would in the past. When I was in Mauritania, there's all sorts of critters. There's of course scorpions, but there's all sorts of other things that are creeping and crawling in your tent and in your house and in your beddings. And as one Mauritanian said, who was a native of the land, he said, I kill everything, meaning everything is suspect. So there's a dua you can make that's of ta'awud, that's a means of protection from these things, spiders, scorpions, snakes, whatever. And that dua is to be said three times in the evening, A'udhu bi karimati Allah at mati min sharri ma khalaq. I seek refuge in, a, in the perfect words of Allah from the evil that He has created. Imam al-Qurtubi, whom we've mentioned before, one of the famous scholars of tafsir, he says that he used to say this dua all the time. He never forgot it. And he was protected. And one day on a trip, he was tired and he forgot to say it. And guess what happened that night? He was stung by a scorpion. It's a means of protection. So note that this is ta'awudh, seeking refuge in Allah, and it's not explicitly from shaitan. It's from other things that could cause us harm. All right? Um, lastly, I'll give you one more. 
it's not on the board. Uh, if you hear a donkey bray or a dog bark. Donkey. The donkey or a dog. Yeah. The Prophet Sallallahu said, إِذَا سَمِعْتُمْ نَبَاحِ الْكِلَابِ وَنَهِيقِ الْحَمِيرِ بِاللَّيْلِ فَتَعَوَّذُوا بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ فَإِنَّهُنَّ يَرِينَ مَا لَا تَرَوْنَ He says, when you hear the uh, barking of dogs or the braying of donkeys at night, at night, seek refuge in Allah from shaitan because they are seeing what you do not see. We hear donkeys are braying all the time. But if in the middle of the night, all of a sudden, a donkey starts braying, of course there's communication between donkeys. But they're also seeing other things. Same for dogs. It could be that the dog is seeing a critter or a human intruder or a possible intruder. And their barking is not the result of seeing jinn shayateen. But that possibility is also there. So it is a sunnah to say, A'udhu billahi bin shaytan rajim When you hear the barking of a dog at night, or the braying of a donkey at night. And then the I mean, it's possible for the animals to see jinn in different conditions. Uh, the fact that it's mentioning it at night doesn't necessarily negate the possibility of them seeing it in the day. But our response is connected to it happening at night. So that's, that's, that's all I know. It's possible for an, animals to see jinn. Animals can see them. Not humans, but animals. Yeah. Humans can see them. Yeah, if Allah lifts the veil, yeah, if Allah lifts the veil, yeah. Allah could cause yeah. human beings to see jinn in different forms, for sure. Yeah. Um, it's definitely within the realm of possibility that all animals are able to see jinn. To what extent and how frequent, I, I don't know anything in specific, but it's possible. And it's also possible, if you're ready to be creeped out a little bit, it's also possible for jinn to take on animal forms. So, yeah. So there's the, anim- so there's the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ about the black dog with the white spot being uh, a jinn. And people hear that and they wonder, how can that be? There's plenty of black dogs with white spots and can they all be jinn? It's either that it's a jinn or the jinn tends to inhabit those kinds of dogs. I will tell you this though, in the, I don't remember the, the exact year, was it the mid 70s or late 70s, early 80s? You've heard of the son of Sam, the serial killer? He was in New York. He went on this killing spree. I think it was the 70s. They call him the son of Sam. He was caught. And many, many years later, Spike Lee made a movie about the son of Sam. Because the son of Sam was imprisoned and he told his story. And he was completely ridiculed and, and denied when he was in court. Because he admitted to the killings, but he said that he started these killings because his dog was speaking to him and ordering him to commit these killings. Guess what? He had a black dog with a white spot. But I think the white spot is specific too. It's not just any white spot anywhere. It had to be... In the front? Yeah. yeah. And underneath. Yeah. So look, look, up, look up Son of Sam... Berkowitz, yeah. Yeah, so he made a movie about him, and they said, okay, he's either, he's insane or he's making it up. But Muslims hear that story and they say, hmm, sounds like this guy was encountering a jinn, and he was doing the bidding of this shaitani jinn in dog form, and it kind of drove him crazy, and he went and did these things. And Allah knows best. You know, I think he later... He later expressed remorse and uh, who knows what happened to that guy. But the point of the story is that people hear these narrations and they think, oh, how could that be? But you have actual instances in history, recent history, of people having black dogs and these kinds of strange encounters. 
it's not to say that if you see a black dog, you gotta run away or anything. I will tell you this, uh, in my grandmother's neighborhood, there were lots of dogs, and there's one dog that would always insist on barking like it was going insane whenever I would walk by in the neighborhood after Jumrah, and it was a black dog with a white spot. And I'd always walk by it and just say, A'udhu Billahi with Shaitan al-Rajim, and just keep going. Yeah, who knows? So inshallah, we'll, we'll stop here. Um, having covered the ta'awudh, we now have the introduction to the Fatiha and how we open with reading the Fatiha with Ta'awudh. In our next class, we'll go into the Basmala and the related issues, and then we'll go verse by verse through the seven verses, insha'Allah ta'ala. Wallahu rasulu a'lam sallallahu wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.